All right, hey guys, um, back with Gilded Age Part Two. So I know we did a massive recap of the first industrial revolution, the market revolution, and what happened out west uh, during this time period. So like I was saying last time, guys, you have to keep in mind that the Gilded Age occurs at the same time reconstruction is going on down south, at the same time as like the old west, at the same time as imperialism that we'll talk about when we get closer to World War I, at the same time as, you know, uh, what's also happening to the farmers in the Midwest. So, the Gilded Age, massive time period. Let's go ahead and dissect what happens to the northern cities during the Gilded Age. Now, we already talked about the abundant natural resources that are available in this country. So we have iron deposits, coal deposits, copper deposits. I mean, you basically name it. We have the abundant natural resources that we need for industrializing the nation. And we already talked about the development of the national market. This was because of the transcontinental railroad and we hinted on the type of population growth that we saw during this time period first ushered in by the Irish before the Civil War, but now after the Civil War, we're gonna see much more of a massive influx of immigrants coming from Eastern Europe. We're talking about Greece, we're talking about Italy, those places. So because of this influx of immigration and people moving to the cities to seek out the factory jobs, we've got a large labor supply right at our disposal to go ahead and work in these factories. So today what we're gonna focus on is the talented entrepreneurs. We're gonna get to know our robber barons slash captains of industry because these guys have two faces going on, a good side and a bad side. And we're also gonna probably talk about friendly governmental policies, so governmental action towards big business we know that there was readily available capital for investment, so large amounts of money flowing. And towards the end, we'll probably get into technology and inventions. So let's go ahead and start straight off with where the Gilded Age actually gets its name. From a Mark Twain novel, A Gilded Age Tale of Today. So this novel written by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner, and dive into this whole like world of political corruption and economic corruption that seemed to be like pretty much staple for the time period. And the way that the book describes America, I mean, it really is just like corruption. So by using the term gilded, we're talking about something that looks nice and shiny on the outside golden, but on the inside is absolutely rotten to the core. We're talking like cheap jewelry, <laughs> how it looks nice and shiny on the outside, but then you scratch underneath the surface and it's just really cheap. That's the Gilded Age, all right? To the rest of the world, we look awesome. We look amazing. We look like, hell, everybody's rich. But no, everybody is not rich in the Gilded Age. We'll see that in a little bit when we go ahead and compare the richest Americans ever. You guys will be surprised at how many Gilded Age people are still on that list. So, um, we're going to see corruption on the political level, corruption the economic level, I mean, and it goes all the way down to local government. So we will probably dive into that too as well. Maybe not in this lecture, but for sure probably the next one. So moving on, let's go ahead and talk about these wealthy entrepreneurs that helped to kickstart the Gilded Age. So we've got two names for them. We've got captains of industry and we have robber barons. So, I mean, Captains of Industry, that, that sounds like a nice name, right? Like, you are you sound like a freaking superhero like that. But honestly, it kind of embodies the side of the wealthy industrialists who transform America with their savvy business skills. And they're seen as kind of like heroes. 
that embody this American dream that we have where you rise up from rags into riches. And one robber baron in particular is going to like embody that side. We'll get to him in a bit. But for the vast majority of them though, robber baron is probably the more appropriate term. Because these guys, yeah, they are savvy business people, but they're ruthless. They are moral. They're greedy. They're corrupt. They bribe government officials on both the local, state, and national levels. And I mean, their illegal business practices that they do that are illegal now because of them. And the way that they treated their workers is absolute cruelty. I mean, there were no worker laws back then. No protections for workers whatsoever. And it's because of how these robber barons treated their workers that we fixed these problems during the progressive era. So like I was telling you guys last time, Gilded Age is problems. Progressive era brings us the solution. So if you keep that in mind, you'll pretty much be good for this part of the time period. So, these robber barons that we're talking about, all right, we're gonna highlight a couple of them. Now, these guys are immensely wealthy. I mean, they controlled 90% of the total wealth in the United States at the time. 90%. That means everybody else was only earning 10% of the wealth. Like, what? Seriously, we have never seen this big of a gap between rich or poor ever before or since. So that's why I'm saying like on the surface, we look amazing and super like rich, but really everybody is looking at the robber baron. They're not scratching underneath the surface to see the workers who work for the robber barons, because certainly they did not share in the riches. So the robber barons that we are talking about in particular will be people like Andrew Carnegie, who controls the steel industry, John D. Rockefeller, who controls the oil industry, Cornelius Vanderbilt and his son William, who are going to control railroads and shipping early on in the Gilded Age, Jay Gould rises up the ranks and controls the railroads and speculating on the stock market. He kind of dabbles into like everything along with JP Morgan. JP Morgan concentrates on banking and finance, but this guy definitely diversifies his stock per portfolio and even gets into like electricity with uh, Edison. We also have Jim Fisk and Daniel Drew who are kind of like the partners in crime with Jay Gould. Um, so we're going to go ahead and discuss them briefly as well. There are way more people that we could talk about in the Gilded Age, but these kind of highlight, you know, the type of robber baron that she had because yeah, there was varying degrees on that. So let's go ahead and go on and see what industries actually made the most money. So a lot of people are going to get rich off of railroads because like we said, the transportation boom was happening right before the Civil War and afterwards. And railroads were leading the way, especially after the development of the Transcontinental Railroad. This was your primary method of transportation of goods and people. So beyond that, we've got finance. You know, playing the stock market, the stock market is still kind of relatively new around this time. So yeah, people are going to be like really taking advantage of that. Some of it is inherited. Some of it is old money in the instances of the Astors. John Jacob Astor, his, you know, grandfather earned a lot of money off of real estate in Manhattan. So some of that money is going to carry over. Retailing. This is the rise of department stores and the like. So department stores like Macy's. I mean, this is when they get their start. Also real estate. People are speculating in land out west, so they earn a lot of money off of that. And speaking of out west, the timber 
um, mills and stuff, the ones that would produce lumber are going to earn a massive amount of money at this time as well. Steel. Steel is going to transform the country because when you think about it, guys, I mean, this is how we are going to honestly build skyscrapers, build steel suspension bridges. The railroads use a ton of steel. So yeah, the steel industry is going to be booming. So really, this is where we see our money. And let's go ahead and pause for a minute because I want to show you guys where exactly these Gilded Age wealthy industrialists stand in even current times compared to our modern day rich Americans. So let's pause for a bit while I get this on the screen. All right, guys, we're back. So let's go ahead and discuss the wealthiest Americans. This is your top 30. And this list was compiled by USA Today. And um, let's go ahead and go through this. So just YouTube, this is not sponsored. All right, just we're just using the news, okay? Just, yeah, educational purposes. So let's go ahead and discuss the richest Americans ever. Now, let's go ahead and count this down. I'm gonna count down how many wealthy Gilded Age people we've got. So, starting at number 30, Jim Walton. All right, he is not Gilded Age, he is Walmart, <laughs> okay? Him and his brother Sam Walton um, helped develop Walmart. Oh, he's, he's the son of Sam Walton. There we go. Yeah, related. Okay, Gilded Age. Look at the industry right here, railroads. All right, this is John Ainsley Blair. So, there we go, guys. One Gilded Age person so far. Okay. Oh, look. There's another one. <laughs> Cyrus Curtis. In publishing. Publishing, we see the rise of mass media at this time. And what we mean by mass media will be newspapers, magazines. This guy in particular created Ladies Home Journal. The Evening Post, he bought that one, and the Philadelphia Inquirer, so yeah, this guy is definitely into publishing. Okay, so far we're at two Gilded Age people. Alright, the Koch brothers. They're, they're modern. Um, they get their money off of um, just investing in industries. Alright, hey look, another Gilded Age person. William Whiteman in pharmaceuticals. Because, yeah, we're going to see the rise of pharmaceutical companies as well at this time. And uh, time travel tip, guys, don't take the snake oil. <laughs> and beware of um, some of the pharmaceuticals because they are pushing some hard drugs. <laughs> what we would consider hard drugs now. You can ask me in class. Alright, James Fair. Look at that, another Gilded Age guy. He gets his money off of mining out west. Alright. This guy's Google, so uh, modern. Okay. Hey look, another Gilded Age guy right here. Russell Sage off of the stock market. So, what are we at guys? Five Gilded Age people out of nine? Yeah. I'm telling you, these people are freaking wealthy. Okay. Here's another Google guy, Larry Page. So again, modern money. Oh look, Gilded Age. Moses Taylor gets his money off a developing city bank, which is still a major bank, so. Um, up into modern times, for sure. Now, Bloomberg. Okay, he's, he's a modern, wealthy, wealthy owner right here. Then we got Andrew Mellon, another Gilded Age guy, who makes his money off of banking again. So we got finance there as another key industry, right? Banking and finance. So, so far we're at seven Gilded Age people. Okay, here's another modern day um, wealthy business owner, Larry Ellison off of uh, Oracle, which is a software company. 
Mark Zuckerberg. You guys know him from Facebook, <laughs> all right? He's on the list as well. Henry Ford. All right, here's the deal with Henry Ford. Henry Ford, we're going to throw him in with the Gilded Age because he gets his start in the Gilded Age, although he makes his most of his money during the Progressive Era and beyond. He's kind of like the wealthy industrialist that bridges the gap between the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era, so we'll, we'll explain that a bit more when we get to the Progressive Era. Marshall Field. He is definitely a Gilded Age guy. He makes his money off of department stores, because during the Gilded Age we see the rise of department stores at this time. So, yeah. Another Gilded Age guy. We are up to nine Gilded Age people. Oh look, Jay Gould. <laughs> yeah. He makes his money off of railroads and... Yeah, railroads for sure. This guy is notorious. We will talk about him in a bit. Stay tuned. Warren Buffett. He is more modern. He gets his money off of um, Berkshire Hathaway, which is his company. Oh look, Frederick Weyerhaeuser. He is Gilded Age as well. Gets his money off of the lumber industry. And then Bill Gates. He, see, Bill Gates is 11. Hello. Do we have a lot of Gilded Age people coming up still? Just saying. Okay, moving on. Let's go ahead. Oh, Alexander Turney Stewart. Another Gilded Age person. Makes his money off of department stores. Alright, let's continue. Andrew Carnegie. Steel. Another Gilded Age guy. We're up to 13 now, guys. All right. Steven Van Renessler. He is old money. So when we saw on the chart before the inherited money, he would be part of the inherited money. As well as John Jacob Astor, which we'll see later in the list. Richard Mellon, another Gilded Age guy here. Off of banking. Steven Girard. He is old money. He made his money off of shipping. In particular, like, during the War of 1812 and, and such. Old money. John Jacob Astor. Old money off of the fur trade and real estate. Okay, here's, here's Amazon. Jeff Bezos at number four. I'm telling you guys, some of the Gilded Age people are incredibly freaking rich. No joke. Okay, here's Sam Walton with Walmart. Alright, which leaves us two, which are the big two for the Gilded Age. We've got Cornelius Vanderbilt, off of shipping and railroads. And, number one, and it will probably never be toppled, John D. Rockefeller. Because honestly, guys, if we're looking at the richest people ever in the world, John Rockefeller makes that list. He's up there with the likes of William the Conqueror and Mansa Musa. I'm telling you, we will never see this type of wealth probably ever again. Because some of the stuff that he did is incredibly illegal. So, that is our richest Americans of all time list. And, let's go ahead and continue, guys. So, um... Moving on. Now, like we said, okay, these guys are immensely wealthy. This is an outdated list right here, but I wanted to show you guys that new list so you could go ahead and make the comparison. So, um, let's go ahead and analyze a political cartoon for a minute and see this contemporary political cartoon showing robber barons. Robber barons of medieval times and robber barons of essentially today, which is Gilded Age. And you see how they have on their sashes, it says trust. Whenever you see the word trust, just think of monopoly, okay? It's essentially the same deal. The sword is legislation, so this shows you that they have their hands on politics. 
government is not going to regulate these people because government is super corrupt at this time too. The poor farmer is giving the interest in their mortgaged farm. The laborer is giving their wages. The people of this country and the politicians are giving their tax money to these wealthy industrialists. And the caption reads, history repeats itself, the robber barons of the Middle Ages and the robber barons of today. Continuing on, look at this. These robber barons are sitting upon their millions and the backs of the laborers are kelp to keeping them afloat during these hard times which you see written here in the water. And look at the wages that these people have. Cloth workers average $9 a week. Linen workers $11 a week. Iron workers $7 a week. Lumber workers $6 a week. Leather workers $7 a week. Paper workers six dollars a week so really you could see how unfair and how big of a gap in wages in wealth that we have in this country at the time so this time period is written with scandal and one of the first major scandals happens, of course, with the first big business of the country, which is the railroads. So remember back when we we're talking about the Transcontinental Railroad being built, we had two companies. We had the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific. Thomas Durant is running the Union Pacific, and he has this plan to go ahead and come up with a company called Credit Mobilier and essentially it's him paying himself <laughs> to build the railroad because he subcontracts to this fake company he developed called Credit Mobilier. So he's really getting like so many more federal subsidies from the government. He's just like striking it rich off of this scheme. He even has politicians involved on the national level. I mean, even future president James Garfield is going to be involved in this scandal. So really, I mean, big business just has no boundaries at this time. Corruption exists way into politics. Big business just keeps pushing the envelope, seeing how far they can go with getting their money and getting what they want. So this is just one example. And the show I was telling you guys about yesterday, Hell on Wheels, the opening scene of that show, pretty much the first like 10 minutes, is, devel is devoted to this, the Credit Mobilier scandal. So again, Watch the show if you guys have time and parent permission. It'll give you a good insight on how the West connects to the North during the Gilded Age. So another big scandal that we see is um, what Jay Gould and company do to Cornelius Vanderbilt during the Erie War. Okay guys, so let's go ahead and discuss the Erie War. So. Um, a good show to watch on the Erie War is actually a documentary by the History Channel. There's a segment in The Men Who Built America that showcases the Erie War. So, let me give you guys a little bit of a breakdown. Now, the Erie Line was an independent railroad line um, that ran from New York City to Buffalo. Like we said, like Railroads at around this time started regionally based. They were short tracks. They weren't quite the big national, you know, things that we saw later on in the Gilded Age. But um, Cornelius Vanderbilt has been buying up shorter tracks and such to kind of consolidate and to make his company bigger. So three men, James Fisk, Jay Gould, and Daniel Drew, were able to pull their profits together 
to take control of this railroad. And they want to make as much money as possible. Cornelius Vanderbilt, who owns the New York Central Railroad at this time, uh, wanted to take over the Erie Line. So Drew Gould and Fisk did something highly illegal now. What they did was watered down stocks, which means they kept printing out paper stocks to where the other paper stocks were, the value was inflated so much. Um, and Vanderbilt kept buying these stocks and buying these stocks and buying these stocks, these fake stocks. So really, when all was said and done, Vanderbilt loses a million of dollars in the process trying to control the Erie Company. If we're to do like an equivalent of today, I mean, it'd be like probably billion. Like, he lost a lot of money. So, um, Vanderbilt tries to appeal to politicians about this. Um, Gold, Fisk, and Drew escaped to New Jersey and then proceeded to bribe the same politicians <laughs> to prevent Vanderbilt from getting the sale of the Erie Line. So what ended up happening, Vanderbilt loses a ton of money. Um, Drew, Gold, and Fisk make a big name for themselves of being ruthless and <laughs> Yeah, they end up the big winners in this and taking out one of the most powerful men in the country. Or not taking him out, but like beating him. So, this brings us to Cornelius Vanderbilt. Okay, we talked about him briefly when talking about the railroads and the development of the railroads in this country. So, Cornelius Vanderbilt kind of bridges the gap between the market revolution and the first industrial revolution to the gilded age and the second industrial revolution because during the market revolution i mean he makes billion well he makes a lot of money not billions but a lot of money on shipping on steamboats and then he has the foresight to go ahead and sell off that business to invest fully into railroads so, I mean, he is worth billions and billions of dollars today. We saw it on the list. This, of course, is not an accurate number right now. But really, the Vanderbilts spend so much money on their massive homes. This is just the inside of Hyde Park. Well, the Vanderbilt Mansion in Hyde Park. And one of many. Okay, they, they owned Fifth Avenue mansions in New York City. I mean, real estate is their thing. <laughs> so you want to look up more pretty pictures of Vanderbilt mansions. I suggest looking at The Breakers, which is in Newport, Rhode Island, and looking at Biltmore, which is in um, North Carolina. So, those were not owned by Cornelius Vanderbilt, but they're owned by his grandchildren. So, it just goes to show you guys, the Vanderbilt wealth is massive. Massive. And they like to flaunt it with parties and homes. Okay, so, the notorious people in the Erie War would be Daniel Drew who ends up getting screwed over by um, Fisk and Gold in the process. They betrayed him and um, caused him to lose $1.5 because of the manipulating of the stock prices. So, <laughs> this kind of caused the downturn in the economy. Um, well, rather, the downturn in the economy caused him to lose more money, and by 1876, Daniel Drew files for bankruptcy, and he dies a few years later, broke living with his son. So, I mean, it just goes to show you guys that robber barons will use you up, and there's no love lost between these friends. Seriously. Jay Gould is probably the most notorious of these guys. I mean, newspapers are calling him the worst man in the world. Whoa. <laughs> Seriously. He gets a lot of wealth through dishonest practices, bribing elected officials, plotting against his opponents, and even his friends. He makes most of his money off of railroad speculation, but he also controls companies like Western Union, the Telegraph Company. 
1869, him along with his partner in crime, Jim Fisk, tried to gain control of the gold market. So they even get President Grant's brother-in-law involved in this. So their speculations lead to the Black Friday scandal. And this is going to end up bankrupting thousands of individuals, collapsing 14 brokerage houses and several banks. These guys are ruthless. Also, he uses stock manipulation, insider trading, both are highly illegal right now as a practice for getting wealthy. And I mean, really, he is something else. I mean, check out this quote here. I can hire one half of the working class to kill the other half. No wonder he was called the Mephistopheles of Wall Street by the New York Times. Seriously, not even other robber barons really liked this guy. When Andrew Carnegie was on opening up Carnegie Hall, he basically told Jay Gould to go away. <laughs> he didn't want him in Carnegie Hall. So what does Jay Gould do? Well, he takes his millions and he ends up opening up the Metropolitan Opera House. <laughs> the pettiness of these people, really, and just the massive amount of wealth that they had is crazy. So what happens to uh, Jay Gould's partner in crime, Jim Fisk? Well, he ends up getting what's coming to him, almost, like, honestly. After, you know, the Black Friday scandal and, you know, stuff dealing with um, Vanderbilt with the Erie War, and even opening an alliance up with Boss Tweed, the most notorious political machine boss at the time, he is going to end up becoming murdered by a business associate over money and over a girl. <laughs> so he meets his end in 1872. Now, the richest man of the robber barons is John D. Rockefeller. He's an important one. So Rockefeller earns a lot of money off of oil and his company is named Standard Oil. It's a clean, clear name for a company because clearly he's setting the standard. So he is going to basically do predatory practices like um, lowering down prices of oil to the point where his competitors can't keep up. And then he swoops on in, he buys up the competition and jacks up the prices of oil again. He is going to control the refineries around Cleveland, which has a large oil deposit there. And by 1900, Standard Oil, well, by 1890, rather, Standard Oil is such a huge monopoly at the time that it basically runs the show. I mean, roughly around 90% of the oil industry. This guy is massively wealthy, as we saw on the list before. Again, these are inaccurate numbers here on this slide. Andrew Carnegie is one rubber baron that actually embodies the whole rags to riches because he himself is a poor Scottish immigrant. He comes over to this country. Um, he works as a telegraph operator with the Pennsylvania Railroad and then later, you know, as a secretary for that railroad. During this time when he's making his money, he invests with George Pullman in the sleeping car business and makes a lot of money off of that. Plus, you know, he's gonna gain some profits from some oil wells on a huge farm that he purchased. Um, he builds this big iron suspension bridge. So while he's doing that, he is going to concentrate on steel. He goes back to um, Europe and he comes across Henry Bessemer, who has this process of creating steel a lot cheaper and easier than ever before. Because at this time, guys, steel was a pretty wealthy, wealthy metal. Like, you had to pay a lot of money for steel. But thanks to the Bessemer process and making it easier to produce, 
steel becomes a lot more manageable to produce and when um, Andrew Carnegie brings over the Bessemer process to the United States, he's going to make a ton of money with his company Carnegie Steel. So um, he was kind of different. He did actually support workers' rights to organize, but um, it's going to kind of backfire on him when um, his partner, which is um, Henry Frick, basically goes against the workers at Homestead and it ends up becoming a huge, huge strike, notorious strike. And again, the men who built America highlights that strike. So you want a good look at the Gilded Age? Watch the men who built America. Now, um, kind of like later on in life, he has a change of heart and he's going to go ahead and promote this whole gospel of wealth which basically he argues that, hey, God gave me my riches. Um, we should help those less fortunate and, you know, just donate our money. Um, spend it on society, essentially. So he's going to basically create the public library system. Like, really. He's going to donate so much money to creating libraries at universities throughout different towns across America, I mean, he is definitely going to embody his gospel of wealth. So this is Andrew Carnegie, and again, gospel of wealth, he's telling rich people that they should donate their riches and benefit society. Okay. One Robert Barron who was born rich is J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan comes from a wealthy investment family which, you know, involves, you know, his father. Um, they have the company Morgan and Company, and they're a wealthy investment firm. So JP Morgan ends up reorganizing this company into JP Morgan and Company. And you guys may know his company even better now as JP Morgan and Chase Bank. So this guy makes a ton of money off of the banking and financing industries, plus by investing in various industries across the country, like railroads and steel and electricity. So really, he's gonna end up having enough money to buy out Carnegie Steel, and he creates US Steel, which is still around today. Plus, when the country goes under a financial panic, this guy's rich enough to loan the country money. Just saying, guys. Kilded Age wealth is massive. What he likes to spend his money on is going to be fine artwork, antiques, books. His library in New York City is impressive. Think Beauty and the Beast library. That's his library, essentially, in real life. Like, this is... A crazy amount of wealth and I mean look at his look at his quote right here if you have to ask how much it costs you can't afford it bro <laughs> this is this is JP Morgan <laughs> for real all right so businesses um, we're gonna have large businesses created at this time because the business climate is very favorable to big businesses. I mean, there was no government regulation of big business in the late 1800s. Big businesses could do what they wanted. Laissez-faire was essentially the philosophy of the day. I mean, just a hands-off approach to government, can, well, to business when it concerned governments, along with ideals like social Darwinism that we'll talk about later, and individualism. I mean, this is pretty much the age of the robber baron. So really, workers are going to be on the receiving end of the negativity of this time period because of the lack of regulation on big business. So what we see is really the rise of corporations, all right? 
big business themselves. I mean, corporations have a group of investors. Um, corporations are going to be running the show. And even the Supreme Court will agree. So with the case of Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, the Supreme Court basically says that a private corporation is a natural person and therefore has all the rights of the Bill of Rights at their disposal. So we're basically saying a corporation is, a, is people. This is other level kind of stuff. You want to compare this case to something compared to Citizens United. This is like... Yeah, the Supreme Court was in the pockets of big business. Courts in general were in the pockets of big business. And we'll see that more so with how they face labor strikes. So two very important things we must consider with business is um, what Rockefeller does and what Carnegie does. So we've got horizontal integration and vertical integration. Horizontal integration is just like this. Basically, you're doing mergers. So it would be like if McDonald's and Burger King and Jack in the Box and Wendy's and Whataburger like, were all like bought by the same company. So that would be horizontal integration. You are buying up the competition. Vertical integration, what Carnegie does, is a bit different. You are buying your suppliers. So it would be like this, like let's say we have a company that makes um, paper, okay? You'd basically be buying up the lumber, you'd be buying up uh, the machinery and such that processes the lumber and helps you create the paper, plus you would also own the transportation to ship this paper you know, around the world, essentially. So, really, you're paying nobody but yourself to create your product. That is what vertical integration is. So, you guys understand that? You are your own supplier. So, Carnegie has iron mines. He owns the transportation to get this iron to his steel mills. And he produces steel. So he pays nobody but himself. Both of these are ingenious and they earn both people a massive amount of wealth. So that's horizontal integration and vertical integration. And then I'm going to throw this term at you guys. Trust. All right. A trust, just think of it as a monopoly. Let's make your guys' life easier. Okay. It's generally used as a term for monopoly. Even though it isn't exactly a monopoly, just treat it like that, guys. <laughs> just treat it like that, all right? So, Rockefeller takes advantage of the whole trust situation. He's able to build up a massive oil empire off of, you know, consolidating trusts. So, yeah, 90% of the oil refining capacity of the nation. And to tell you guys how big this is, the United States was like the leading um, refinery nation in the world at that time. So this guy essentially is controlling 90% of like the oil supply in the world. <laughs> A ton of freaking money through this guy. So you see the symbol right here of the octopus? This is basically going to symbolize Standard Oil and Rockefeller in political cartoons. This is one of the more famous ones. You see the oil barrel right here it says Standard Oil, and it looks like the tentacles of the octopus are going into everything. State government, local government, stretching across the seas, wrangling up politicians in the, in the process and other refineries. I mean, yeah, it's a matter of time for Rockefeller's business practices to be exposed. And they are exposed by journalists called muckrakers. In particular, we have this one right here, which is Ida Tarbell. And she writes the history of the Standard Oil Company, where she reveals the ruthless business practices of John D. Rockefeller. 
So we're going to start to see pockets of journalists come about during the Gilded Age, start to write about the system, exposing this corruption. And it will come to a head during the progressive era when people have already read enough of this stuff that they're producing and they start to actually put action in place to stop this abuse and corruption, both in business and in politics. Because really, trusts have the country captive at this time. They're making Uncle Sam walk the plank and they're raising the trust flag with labor, you know, being the skulls and crossbones are basically representing the death of labor. And you see the caption here, one sees his finish unless good government retakes the ship. And that's really what's needed, guys. We need government to step up and regulate business before it's too late. So with that, guys, I'm gonna leave you for the day we still got more of the Gilded Age to go on. I'm telling you guys, this time period is a beast. <laughs> so, yeah, we will continue this in the next one, guys, when we're going to talk about something that's going to make you want to punch one of these guys in the faces, <laughs> which is uh, social Darwinism. So stay tuned. We'll see you next time, guys.